Is it a riveting social commentary about uncontrolled nuclear testing, or just a giant monster that breaks things? All these questions will probably not be answered in tonight's review of Godzilla, the 2014 reboot. Gojira. Gojira. Welcome everybody to our uh, our late belated review. Uh, sorry guys, we have 9 to 5 Jones. Uh, we just finally got back from the 2014 reboot of Godzilla. The second U.S. reboot of Godzilla. Because um, most of the time when it's being rebooted, it's Toho being done. This time it was being done by Legendary Pictures with the advisory, or with, with advisors from Toho. So, um, let's get into it. First of all, spoiler alert for those who have not watched these before. We are going to go into the films in depth. We, I think we have talked about doing a condensed version for people, but for the moment we're talking full-on spoilers. So if you have not seen it and you are excited to see the, the Godzilla reboot, put this thing on pause, go to your nearest theater and go see it. We'll wait. I don't no, we, we never won't. wait. We never wait. We're impatient souls. We're gamers after all. Let's get on with it. Uh, <clears throat> so let's go into the plot. Which it feels like there should have been a lot, uh, there was way more than there should have been. I couldn't even follow the plot in this. Yeah, the, the, he, here's the thing to, for people to realize, especially if you're Toho fans and you haven't seen us, um, just for those who are actually, you know, gluttons for punishment. Uh, this is a kind of a weird fusion. Uh, it's, it's almost like a retelling of, like, the original 1950s, I don't know if the 80. In the 80s movie was a was a retelling either but it's like the original 1950s trying to tell the origins of godzilla and see him as an actual villain see him as a as an actual natural disaster and then the fusion part is like it's kind of fused with that whole campaign that happened in the 80s and 90s where godzilla was kind of the savior of the earth kind of thing so when we saw trailers of this i mean we we were literally being told this was a natural disaster kind of film. And therefore, everybody was like, yes, Godzilla is is returning and, and he's a bad guy again. Um, we start in the plot with uh, a pre or prequel exposition kind of thing to, I can't uh, to Ford Brody, a little boy, Ford Brody, and his father and mother, uh, who are living in Japan in, I'm guessing that's the, it was Genjira, is that the province, or, I can't remember. Yeah, I think it might have been the name of the city. It could be the city. It was the, they, they were both technicians at the Genjira, and am I saying that right? Yeah. Uh, nuclear plant, and uh, little Ford was living there and going to school at the time. And for some weird reason, uh, then we cut to... Ken Watanabe, and I can't remember his name, it was like Dr. Serizawa. Yeah. Um, where he's been researching something and we don't know what, obviously he's the researcher for Godzilla. Um, he finds a, a big bone cavern, basically, and then discovers something living inside of it. Then we come back, if you guys aren't already having the whiplash, welcome to the movie, we already did. Um, where there seems to be a problem at the nuclear plant, they keep on having these constant tremors, that the Japanese workers think is just an earthquake or, you know, pre precursor to a tsunami kind of thing. And uh, the father of Fort Brody, and I, and I can't remember his name, and now I can't remember who's playing him, but he's, he's under the uh, suspicion that it's more than that because it's consistent. So he sends down his wife to go look at the nuclear reactor just to make sure everything is fine. Then all hell breaks loose, and uh, he unfortunately has to seal the door to keep the radiation from leaking into the entire uh, into the entire plant, thus killing his wife in the process because she was exposed to radiation. Uh, and he kind of goes off into a crazy deal because he killed his wife, and, and this whole thing happened. We then cut to Ford now as an adult who works for the Explosives Ordnance Disposal Unit. At, is that, uh, yeah. that right? Yeah. Uh, and he's just barely getting home from a tour of duty. And he gets a call that his dad's gotten into yet another... Uh, 
he's gotten into jail again because his dad, I guess, has this bad habit of going into the court to the where they used to leave, where they used to live, now a quarantine zone, uh, because he wants answers and he also wants a picture of his wife and all that. So we're we're made to feel. Is it Brian Cranston? Yeah, is his Brian name Brian Cranston. Cranston. And so Ford and I don't remember the actor's name. Guys, there shouldn't have been really much of a human plot here. I'm just going to point that out. Uh, he goes back. They then decide that they need to go into the quarantine zone because there's way too much that doesn't make sense here. Then all hell breaks loose again because we find out that the Jenjita nuclear plant, which was supposed to be destroyed, is now a spawning ground? Of some kind. Of yeah. some kind, yeah. And... For some weird reason, all the humans there thought it would be a good idea to let the nuclear plant keep running and let this thing feed on the nuclear energy. For science, I guess. For si- Of course! Don't you know anything about science? Uh, and so, at that point, we cut back to Ken Watanabe's character, who knew about this, and I guess he was kind of the guy saying, we can't kill it, uh, we need to study it. <clears throat> and, uh, wow, he regretted that decision very quickly. Because there's no possible way that could go wrong. Nothing at all! The egg hatches, and uh, all hell breaks loose. <laughs> I, I know I'm going to say that a lot in this movie, but that's basically the way to describe it. And we have... We couldn't find names for these unexplained monsters, so we're going to go with the movie's term, Muto which was, I think, Massively Unidentified Terrestrial, terrestrial object. object. So we're just going to call them Mutos, like the movie did. And at that point, this thing breaks out of the nuclear plant and starts heading east. Uh, we don't know why at that given moment, but Ford Brody is there as his father is dying because he, he took some damage from the nuclear plant falling apart. And then... Dr. Sarazawa pulls him aside and asks, since his, his dad was the nuclear technician of that plant, he wants to know the information that he knew. Uh, Ford gives him whatever information that he had, uh, which isn't really much. It's basically pushing the, the plot along. And th th this was all an exposition moment. It was trying to explain, okay, all the nuclear testing facilities that happened all in through the 60s and the 70s, they weren't testing facilities. They were trying to kill it. They were trying to kill Godzilla. And they've even codenamed it, uh, well, the Japanese term, Gojira. Uh, and so at that point, this monster isn't that. And from there, we find out that this is where the movie gets weird because it tries to re-explain Godzilla's origin. Where, I might be wrong about this, but like in the 50s films and the 80s films, Godzilla's origin was he was a product of nuclear testing. Um, a lizard absorbed too much radiation and then therefore grew to larger sizes and is Godzilla. Uh, in this one, they try to explain that he is pretty much the last living dinosaur. Um, and, and the fact that monsters got so big back in those days that the only way for them to survive was they had to feed on radiation. I don't know how radiation existed when the planet was young, but they tried to explain, yes, it existed. Radiation exists naturally. It's not just a product yes. of nuclear Yes, weapons. but not, not enough to the point where it, it would make sense that something could thrive on it, uh, at least to my, to my knowledge of it. And the way that they try to explain it is that as the planet matured, um, Godzilla buried itself deeper and deeper to get itself closer to the planet's core and feed there. Okay. So that's what they try and explain with that. Uh, then we cut to Hawaii, where another strange disturbance has occurred. Not only is the monster that they've been following from Janjita uh, there, but there's also this mysterious fin that appears in front of a ship fleet and then goes right under it and creates kind of a waveform. And then we... Bear in mind, guys, this is like 45 minutes into the film. About... 45 minutes in, we finally get to see the thing this movie is named after. Godzilla steps up, and we have, we're supposed to have a fight, but we cut. But we cut, because the people story is just so much more entertaining. Yes, the little boy actually sees it on TV, 
And that's how, that's kind of what we get. That, that's kind of the thing that happens throughout this whole movie is little kids are seeing it on the TV while the parents are being stupid. And in this case, it was it wasn't just the you're talking about Ford Brody's kid. Yeah. It wasn't just Ford's kid that saw it. It was the kid that uh, was with Ford in the train when it went dead. The other thing also that they try to explain is that these monsters are basically walking EMPs, so you know when they come because everything shuts off. Except they don't really explain that that well, because even with Godzilla in the premises, lights turn back on. Yeah. So, so. that's not really all that well explained. But yeah. anyway. So, we have what we're supposed to think is a monster fight. And then we find out that apparently there's another egg. That egg is in the Yucca Mountain facility in Nevada, where all the nuclear waste dis disposal is stored. Bear in mind, these things feed off of nuclear energy. It's almost like they didn't think that one out. Yes. And it literally walks out of the mountain. I don't think you're going to be able to get that hole fixed. And it starts making its way to the other one, to which they then decide that since they have different fields... By the way, this thing like literally walks through Las Vegas, and that's the best part. <laughs> I hate to say that, but like they, they go to this casino scene and everybody, like nobody's paying attention to the TV and there's breaking news. And all of a sudden, EMP. Oh man, the slots went down. Boom! I think you've got a bigger problem than losing your slot, co slot tokens. Uh, and so they, they literally have a walk through Vegas and it starts making its way to the other. Well, Dr. Sarazawa and his assistant are trying to figure out why they're doing this, <coughs> then they, they pretty much come to the... Especially since one looks kind of similar to the other, but one has wings and the other doesn't. And that's when Sarazawa des, de, deciphers that one must be female and one must be male. And they are meeting together to mate. I'm trying to think if that's ever been done in a Godzilla movie. It probably has, but we haven't seen all the Toho flicks. Uh... And then Godzilla is also trying to meet them both because, according to Dr. Sarazawa, nature always has a way to balance the equation. And so, in this case, Godzilla is the balance. Yes. Um, he is, he's the, or how is it the army put him? He is the alpha predator. Um, basically saying Godzilla is the top of the freaking food chain. Get over it. Uh, so, at that point, they find out that it, they're all going to converge on San Francisco and the army's plan, because the army always works out so well in these movies, um, is to take a nuclear bomb and lure them all in with it, and then ex and then have it explode. And they're going to make sure that the populace is nowhere near, so that the fallout doesn't affect them. And that's their plan. Keep in mind, people who watch the Toho films, the military's ideas never work. At least to my knowledge, they never did. So, in the meantime, we have these, this other long intermission between monster fights where they're following Godzilla, and they're following the other monsters, and they're following and following and... God, that's guys, all this movie is. Guys, it, it, like, like I said, it was like 50, 40, 50 minutes before we got to see Godzilla for the first freaking time. And then... <clears throat> We literally probably go another half hour before we see him again uh, coming out of the water. Fins don't count, people. Yeah. We want to see a giant monster. Um, so I, I can't really go too much else into the plot other than the monsters meet, they breed, they take the nuclear warhead and actually use it to feed all the children. Ford Brody is central to this plot because he finally decides that while they're trying to get rid of the nuclear warhead, they ought to get rid of the babies, too. And uh, he decides to take that little cavern that the mothers created and light it aflame. Mommy's not happy about that, as you could probably tell. And at that point, somewhere in there, we finally get what... And, and, and here's another gripe I'm just going to go into. We are hinted at that we're going to get a big monster fight. And then this film goes out of its way to troll us 
and close doors and close windows. And every time you see that first hit about to happen, close door and you're like, why? Why? Uh -huh. I came to a Godzilla film to see giant monsters fight. Why are you constantly closing the door? And so at that point, you know, the movies trolled you enough that you go, <laughs> okay, now you get to see your monster fight. Um, and we get a glorious two-on-one fight between Godzilla and the Mutos, and it is wonderful. Uh, you know, we actually get to see what everybody in 1998 was waiting for. We needed, we got to see Godzilla's nuclear fire, and uh, he's, dude, freaking brutal. I mean, he is like Peter Jackson, King Kong, brutal. This is, the, I, I get now why people want like a current, up to date. Godzilla versus King Kong, because these things would be brutal mother effers to each other. Like, there would be no Fs given towards anybody. But we end things out with Godzilla kills the monsters. They think he's died, or he's killed, because he falls in the middle of San Francisco's remains. And then while they're doing cleanup, he wakes up. And goes back to and the goes ocean. Back, and goes back to the ocean. Again, kind of the savior of the earth plot is... In fact, I found it interesting that they, they cut to, like, a CNN bo a news bar going, and it says, King of the Monsters, Savior of the Earth? And, and so at that point, I'm like, yeah, this is kind of a weird fit, uh, take on this flick. But that's Godzilla in a nutshell. Alex, let's go into the pros and the cons, and I'm going to let you start. Okay, I'll start with the pros, uh... For one, I was surprised this movie had opening credits. I grasped oh, yeah. at, grasp at straws here, but I can't think of the last time I've seen a movie with opening credits. I think, again, they were trying to imitate, you know, like old 50s films yeah. and having opening credits. Yeah, that's, you know, it's nice. It's kind of becoming a, shockingly, it's becoming kind of a dying art. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you can really kind of set the set up mood and if you do a good opening, <coughs> opening credits montage. Especially with, with that opening credit montage, it's all like sightings yeah so it really worked very well and also on top of that it's like dinosaur information and stuff like that yeah brian grant i like brian cranston in this movie mm -hmm. uh he's good in anything he does really and I, I mean really his role was to be the dude that screams yeah you know what that screams what are you hiding yeah. uh we, we actually just we were trying to look up the monster's names and we we actually came across a joke where i was just like this upcoming news, it's Godzilla versus an angry Brian Cranston! Uh, uh, <laughs> um, so we love that. Uh, yeah, I'll agree with you. Uh, Brian Cranston was a good addition to it. but um, More pros. <laughs> yeah, some of the military action was fine, and the, the, the fire breath was great. Mm -hmm. That's all I got, really. Yeah, okay. Uh, my, my pros are obviously, Godzilla looked okay. Um... There were a lot of times where it was very difficult to discern where his eyes were and where his mouth was. Um, there were a lot of shots that were at night, and therefore, when you shoot Godzilla at night, he looks like a big giant mound. Um, and, and that's probably my only beef with the CGI design. When you had him in the day, he looked really good. Uh, he looked both as, as a great homage to the past... And I'm talking like the 50s, you know, Godzilla, where the rubber suit was really kind of obscure. Uh, plus a great mixing of the of all the evolutions of Godzilla, plus a U.S. take on him. Uh, so Legendary did well with him. The Mutos also looked really, really good. Uh, if anything, they looked kind of like other bug-like monsters I've seen in the past. I mean, you know, like things like the Zerg came to mind. For me, uh, nothing bad with them, but it was really kind of difficult to discern what they were. In fact, in a lot of cases, I'm going, is, are they, is this supposed to be a U.S. take on Mothra? Because one flies and one doesn't. <clears throat> or is this supposed to be a U.S. take on Rodan? And that's why I'm going with just Muto, because I don't even think Legendary had those rights. Uh, another pro, I, I would go with Brian Cranston's character. He was the guy who was kind of questioning where everybody was just kind of oblivious. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he was kind of the viewer's way in of saying, no, there's something wrong here when somebody's finding giant bones. He should have been the main character. He really should have. 
Kind of, yeah, and he dies off fairly early. The other character, and I actually think is a little bit more deserving of a spotlight, was Ken Watanabe's character, because yeah. he was the guy who was always trying to explain what Godzilla was, what Godzilla was trying to do, and kind of served as exposition towards the plot of saying, you know, he was the guy who basically said this was nature's way of fighting back. Um, so I'll, I'll applaud them. <clears throat> the military storyline I thought was okay. But we had way too much focus on it. Way too much. Um, and, and here's the thing, guys. To people who watch, like, the old school Toho movies, the military is a focus in the fact that they make one counterattack, it doesn't work, and then they finally wise up and realize they can't do anything about the monsters. And they just let them have it out. Okay? That's the way it should have been, and there's way too much time focused on the military rather than on Godzilla. Especially if you're going to have monsters fight. If it had just been Godzilla, that military time would have been justified. Yeah. Because at that point, it was countermeasures. But the fact that you brought up two other monsters, any average Godzilla fan is going to say, when are they going to fight? Because that's how this is going to end. Yeah. I didn't like the inclusion <clears throat> of two other monsters. I think that's escalating it too quickly. I, like I said, it was one of those things where they were trying to do this weird fusion of... You know, Godzilla is a natural disaster in and of itself, mm -hmm. but then they did this whole 80s campaign of saying Godzilla is a force for good, you know, and, and so that was kind of the weird concept where I agree with you that it should have just been Godzilla. Uh, like we saw in the trailers, I mean, the trailers were saying it was just Godzilla. Yeah, I came in expecting Godzilla, <laughs> not Godzilla and two random monsters. Exactly. So at that point, that was a little weird, but I... I didn't have a problem with that because the the Godzilla movies that I like, just to give kind of an insight here. I'm a Toho fan, but my first Godzilla movie was freaking Son of Godzilla. Okay, I don't take this stuff seriously. I really don't because I've just seen all the silly stuff. I hadn't seen the '50s Godzilla until much later in my life. So at that point, that's when I first got my my first look at uh, Godzilla as a natural disaster. And so, at that point, I was really happy because I'm like, ooh, they're going to fight! But then we have to get into the cons. And, and I'll start the cons up here. Oh, actually, two, two more pros, okay? Because we, we actually got into the debate here because it has to be mentioned. The 98 Godzilla. Mm -hmm. Where did this succeed and where did it fail? Um, it succeeded in the fact that Godzilla was freaking badass. And on top of that, missiles didn't kill him! And on top of that, he breathed fire. Okay? That's one of the biggest trademarks of Godzilla. And even when I saw the 98 film as a kid, I knew Godzilla breathed at least something. You know, for a while there, I thought it was like nuclear acid in a few of those movies. But I knew he breathed something, and yeah. it never happened. The animated series let him breathe fire, but no. We didn't have a single thing. And I just thought, was it Emmerich that did yeah. 98? You wasted so much potential there. Yeah. So much so that I love the fact that I actually, I've never seen this, but apparently somebody actually told me that in Godzilla Final Wars, we actually get to have the original Godzilla versus, literally, literally. Versus the American Godzilla. No, I, I was going to say, and literally bitch slap him out of the movie. Okay. That's how bad it was. That He's literally taken out in one hit. Yeah. From what I hear. So uh. comparisons to that, this movie did a lot better than the 98 one. But, the one thing the 98 film did better than this was Godzilla was in the freaking movie! Yeah. I, so I now think, we go into cons. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there, my biggest con right there is it takes too damn long to get to Godzilla. Right? And I understand... I, I literally, I literally um, inched over to Alex and I said, how many minutes is it? And then we first got our appearance of Godzilla? Yeah, he's right. No clue. Probably, you're probably right. It's probably a good half hour, 45 minutes in. I'm pretty sure it didn't even take that long for Transformers 1, the first Michael Bay movie, to... At the uh, very most, a half hour. At the very most, yeah. Half Actually, hour. no. To get a giant robot appearance? To, yeah, just to first get... First five minutes. First five minutes, exactly. Yeah. 
you know, we get more, as much crap as everybody gives the Transformers movies, there's surprisingly more Transformers in those movies. Yes. As much as there are human characters. Everybody gives crap that there's a human cast and... Okay, I'll, I, get, in, I'll I, get into that. I'm gonna have to pay, play devil's advocate for uh, including an, uh, a human cast because it's a movie. It's got to appeal to a wide, broad audience. It can't just, you know, you're spending several million dollars. You can't just totally appeal purely to small niches, and you know, and that's why they'll include a human cast because otherwise it's just gonna be an animated movie. And I, and I have no problem with them including a cast, but it, and, but you have to discern. Which is the key focus, the human cast or the thing that the movie is named after? Okay? And that's the problem here is that and one the, of the things that also this film succeeds in is where they had a couple of good actors in there. I mean, but they, you notice that in the Godzilla cast, they had maybe one or two notables. The rest were fairly unknown. Yeah. And so that, that was kind of a Pacific Rim take, and I mm -hmm. like that. Uh, yeah, and that's fair <clears> enough. I mean... And, and the notables you do get, they're good notables. They're good yeah. people, right? They're yeah, Ken Watanabe, Brian, Brian Cranston. Cranston. I noticed Richard, G G or Richard T. Jones, but that's just because I'm a I used to watch Judging Amy as a kid. So, you know, I noticed him. Uh, but, yeah, I, I would say that's one of the biggest cons of this film, is there were way too many human moments. And if Godzilla had been the only monster... That would have been justified, mm -hmm. but the fact that there were three, and I it even, didn't justify. I even found just this whole again. I was here <clears> for Godzilla, so I found the whole searching for these other two monsters boring to me most of the yes. time. And there would be like these moments where oh, and I'm sorry, but when you're seeing more of Godzilla's dorsal fin than his actual body, yeah, this is not fun. Yeah, yeah. you know, and I was. I made a I laid. I made a You made me lose my I was going somewhere, and oh yeah, yeah. The, the and there'd, there'd be these moments where like they, they play sad music because like Godzilla's injured or Godzilla's getting overwhelmed, and I'm like, I know I'm supposed to feel sad, but I don't because I've seen Godzilla for all of five minutes fighting. Exactly. Yeah, there's no investment. The only investment that you had was Ken Watanabe saying, "I think he's a force for good," <laughs> and then everybody going, "Nah, you're crazy." I think he's a force of good. And you hadn't seen him do good things. Yeah. <clears throat> so there was no reason to feel bad for him. Aside from, you know, the diehard Toho fans felt bad. But for a newcomer, none. And so Godzilla's apparently on the side of the Navy. Uh, were they trying to destroy him 50 years ago? Yeah. Is he on the side of the Navy or the side of the Earth? Well, either, well, he's like, you know, he's riding alongside the Navy. It's like, yeah, I'm going to show the lawn. It's like they have a... It's yeah, like exactly. Godzilla, it's pretty much... This feels like a very boring prequel to Pacific Rim, honestly. Um, I, 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 would, I would not even go there. But. I love, you know, you know me, I love Pacific Rim, yes. but this is a very uninteresting prequel of but, Pacific But Rim. at least the kaiju in Pacific Rim, you got what they were. Yes. And, uh, and there are there a lot of points where I'm like, Godzilla, seriously, you would not slow down for these little weaklings. You would not. Yeah. You would not play their game. And uh, so I agree with you there. That was weird, but I, I think that was just more for effect. And then at that point, it, it fails because there's too much time spent in that field, in that field of vision, and yeah. Um, the, so that's one of the biggest cons of the film, is that if you're a Godzilla fan, you're going to enjoy this, but you're also going to be pissed off the fact that this is, uh, you know, like, I don't know the total time off the top of my head, but, you know, let's just say it's a two and a half hour movie. 40 minutes plus another 30 minutes mean, okay, so that's an hour and 10 so you basically have an hour and 20 minutes as Godzilla in this movie. That's, that's your movie right there. That's what you came to see. That's what you paid the eight bucks for was half of the movie, not the other half. And so that, that's the biggest disappointment, in, at least in my opinion. The other disappointment was, again, I, I will applaud this movie for, for hiring a minor cast, but there was too much time spent on them. And not in my opinion, for a justified reason. Brian Cranston, that made sense. But then having Ford Brody, who didn't care up until that point about what was going on, except that he saw a giant monster, 
Uh, we have to go through this constant struggle with him trying to get back to his wife and son, but at the same time trying to destroy the giant monsters. You might as well have just had him get reunited, and then, you know, when everything is done, you cut back to him. They're fine, and you're fine. You as a viewer are satisfied. Yeah. You do not need to see for Brody save the day. Okay? Where I think it was a cool moment for him to blow up all the eggs, you could have easily had Godzilla walk over to the egg pit and go, <laughs> middle finger, boom! And, and had the same satisfying effect. I will admit also another great satisfying point was Godzilla breathing fire because they, the, they did the whole thing of it starting from the tail and he, and Alex can even attest for this. I literally just kind of sat there in the theater and went, yes, 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 boom. <laughs> and I had to stop myself mid boom because I was waiting for it to happen. And even some of the deaths in that with the nuclear fire was pretty freaking brutal. Um, but yeah, those are the biggest cons. We you are paying to see Godzilla, and to give to give another comparison to the Michael Bay films, you are paying to see Transformers, not Shia LaBeouf. And so at that point, because where they have done plots both in movie and in TV form, where it focuses more on the Transformers, you could have easily cut out you know 10, 20 minutes in segments. We didn't have to have Megan Fox running in the desert. To make sure that she was a woman. We didn't need that. You could have cut all that out. And made it unnecessary. And then told the story that, that everybody was wanting to see. You know the giant robots. Or in this case the giant monsters. <clears throat> I also think another big troll was. The constant trolling. Of you know. We are here to see giant robots kick each other's asses. And constantly closing the doors and the windows. Just to build up suspense. That's not building up suspense. That's making people want to throw stuff at the screen. Yeah. Because it doesn't it doesn't convey the effect that you think it does. Yeah. It, it may increase the anticipation, but in a lot of cases, I kind of wondered, like, if, if I went to a midnight screening, if a diehard Toho, Toho fan just walked out. And he'd be justified for doing it. So, um, the, other, the other con that I would also bring up is just the weird origin. Yeah, I and didn't like that either. The... You know, I, I get the concept of nature provides a balance, but you could have done the other one and it would have been fine. I mean, you technically did that with the other two monsters that, knew, that you know, yes, they thrived on uh, radiation, but the way that they kind of told that was because they kept on ending up in places with a lot of radiation, they were being resurrected. So they were being brought to life. That's why this movie makes me think of it's a boring <clears throat> prequel of Pacific Rim because the monsters are natural instead of radioactive spawns. Well, but in Pacific Rim they weren't either. I thought they yeah. were not natural monsters. They came from the depths of the earth. Well, th they came from the other dimension. Is okay. where they came from. Right. Uh, so at that point, it's it's another weird sci-fi origin. Uh, but at least the kaiju in Pacific Rim got their end of the food chain. You know, they yeah. they came to destroy. So, whereas these monsters, I think the Mutos got it, where they didn't give a crap about anything else around. They knew they were at the top of the freaking food chain. Godzilla, not so much. And that's why I actually said in a lot of cases, we didn't need to have the human shots of what was going on in the train. All you needed to show was the Muto crunch the train in their mouth, because you, you would have gotten that, Okay. And that would have fulfilled the more monster focus instead of the human focus. Um, so we've set our pros, we've set our cons. Overall, Alex, what would you say? What what score would you give this movie? I give it a five. A five. Uh, five. Uh, give the justification. So like, a, so it's a halfway to successful. Is that just because yeah. of the fact lack of Godzilla? Yeah, it's just overall a boring movie because of that. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a very, very big problem with the film. I will go a little higher, and it's because this movie has a lot of potential, but I think Legendary just was misfocused. Uh, they should have just decided, okay, what is our, what is going to be our main focus here? Is Godzilla a natural disaster, uh, and therefore our human story is justified or do we want to have a monster brawl and then cut out some of the human story. 
Um, so at this point, I would give it probably 6.5. I would, I would say because the moments where we actually got to see Godzilla fight were satisfying enough that I think a Toho fan will enjoy them, a newcomer will enjoy them, uh, but the newcomer will probably, as well as the Toho fan, will just sit there and go, why are we playing this game of following the military, not the giant monsters? Uh, so I'll give it a 6.5 out of 10. It has a lot of potential, but it doesn't live up to it. It's one of those movies where I would really like to see the script and say, this is where you could have cut this scene out and this scene out, and you would have been fine. You know, this script changed quite a few hands, which isn't that unusual, but... No. Really. I, I know, like, at, at one point, David S. Goyer did a rewrite, <clears throat> and but he's not credited, so... Yeah. I, I imagine that means the script's been heavily revised since he touched it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, this script has gone through quite a few hands over the last four years since it got announced. Yeah, so at that point, I, I would really like just... To, to see the script and say, look, you cut this scene out and this scene out. It doesn't need to be there. We didn't need the stuff with... You could have Ford Brody in it, but you don't need to have his wife and kid in it. We get it. He's a military... I mean, you could literally just have the plot of he's a military guy, he wants to do the right thing, and it would have been... You would have conveyed exactly what you needed to convey. Yeah. I mean, um, we didn't need to have his wife and kid. Uh, you know, we didn't <clears throat> have... Yeah, we had the... Kind of going back to Transformers here, but we had the wife and kid of the Josh Duhamel character, and we only see them for like again ten minutes at best, mm -hmm. and then it's just him all the way. Or the or the Sam Woodwicky parents, yeah, which were just comic relief, mm -hmm. um, and you didn't need them. So at that, I, I'm not saying that they didn't do a good job. It's just they're well it was like freaking monster movie. It, it's not. I didn't come here to see. Oh look, he's got a wife and kid. Oh, that's so great. Monster smash. That's what I wanted to see. I wanted to see a monster destroy a building, okay? That's why I checked my brain at the door and all that fun stuff. So it has potential, but it's one of those things where I think that the chainsaw should have been taken to a couple of things. Uh, so with that said, thank you all for watching. Uh, shall we give a sneak peek of what is coming up next in our reviews? Let's go. If you guys didn't think we're going to do this, then you were smoking some kind of crack because the next movie is X-Men Days of Future Past. So we will cover that. Um, we'll also try and find a way, because we, we have actually been getting asked if we were going to cover the Maleficent remake uh, or the retelling of Maleficent. I will probably take care of that. Alex is not really interested, and I totally agree with him. This is one of those things where, again, I got, I got my wife vengeance because she came to us with Godzilla. So I, get, I will go see Maleficent and... Be a good boy. And obviously, we're going to have tons of stuff going on at Draken Shadow. we got plenty of reviews aside from X-Men, and we'll get into all of that. But in the meantime, we're going to make you all wait. Because that's the douches we are. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean it. So, okay. So, <laughs> so long, everybody. Thanks so for watching.